I'm a biologist and I'm interested in the biology of sensory systems, but I'll give you a bit of a patchwork overview about the things that we might have to offer to engineering, perhaps. Um, but that's, um, that's uh, a side that we're exploring in collaborations with Andrea Cavallaro and others in um, X, as, as you'll see in a minute. So I study insects, um, and they might not be high on the agenda for, for many of you, but, um, but for biologists, insects are a fantastic su success story, whereas um, all other animals are, are, are pretty much negligible. So as a first approximation, all animals are insects. Um, so you can see that's just the beetles of all the known animals. Um, there are the Hymenoptera. These are contained the bees and wasps and some that I study. There's flies and, and so on. Um, and then the rest of the animal kingdom is this little bit here. Um, mammals are this tiny yellow slice here, so they don't really figure high on the agenda. So insects are, are a tremendous success story, and of course there is the possible conclusion that one reason for that is that they have good mechanisms of information acquisition, good sensory mechanisms. And that's what, one of the things that we're interested in. Specifically, I study bees. And just to explain a little bit the challenge that a bee faces in its, on, a, on a daily basis. So bees are central place foragers, so they live in a hive, such as this little um, thing here. Then they visit flowers, then they have to come back to the hive. Now, the, the um, area that bees explore and forage from um, is roughly equivalent to the central London congested charging zone. So bees from that little hive spread out over an area of several square miles, up to 10 kilometers away from the hive, actually. Then they'll have to find their way back. It's not an easy task, perhaps, if you've got a brain the size of a pinhead. But they do that on a daily basis. If they don't relocate their hive, they're dead. Okay? So they have to succeed at this um, fairly challenging um, spatial um, navigation task. And it's not a trivial task. If you ever navigate, navigated a foreign city without recourse to either maps or um, communication with um, with, with other people, for example, because of a language barrier, then you'll appreciate the challenge. Now, bees' natural environments are much more difficult than our cities because landmarks in cities are meant to be unique, whereas bees forage in natural environments where every tree can look pretty much the same. Nonetheless, of course, they have to successfully navigate between hives and flowers and find their way back. But that's not all. They also have to discriminate between different flower types amongst all the dozens of flower species in a bee's foraging environment, there might only be a handful that are actually worth exploring um, or, or foraging, exploiting, sorry, um, because of, of how their relatively high nectar rewards compared to others. So bees have to associate colors, scents, flower patterns with the rewards, nectar or pollen that they find in these flowers. So that's the basic um, challenge that our bees face and we exploit it in laboratory setups. Now, bees have a number of sensory capacities that we humans lack um, in line with all um, um, other insects, actually. Um, they have polarization vision, so they can see the plane of polarized light in the sky, um, which is, is tremendously useful as a, as a compass system. You can use the sun for a compass if you have a clock, um, which insects also do, but often, of course, you can't see the sun because it's either, be either behind the horizon or it's behind trees or behind clouds, as you um, experience now on a daily basis. So you don't know where the sun is, which makes a sun compass, if you have only the sun to go by, pretty useless. But if you have any um, mechanisms to extrapolate to where the sun currently is, is if, even if you can't see it, then, then that's very useful. Now, the, the pattern of polar is light actually is, 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 is essentially arranged in concentric ring, rings around the, the sun. So if the sun's just by the horizon and you have these rings um, that, um, that um, indicate in strength of polarization about 90 degrees from the sun, but they're concentric rings around the sun that allow you to, um, to um, reconstruct where it is even if you can't see it. So if the sun then re um, um, rises above the horizon, so this might be mid-morning, um, then the whole pattern of concentric rings shifts, um, and if it's higher up, then again it shifts further. 
bees can see this. Lots of other insects can. Um, we can't, obviously. Um, one way of achieving that sort of polarization sensitivity that is actually implemented um, in, um, in, in insect eyes is by forcing your visually sensitive receptor molecules to be spatially aligned. And that's um, achieved in these types of photoreceptors that insects have, but, um, but we don't. It's a kind of toothbrush arrangement with um, these so-called microvilli, which all point in the same direction. And the opsins, the visually, the, 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 the molecules that actually capture light are all forced into a spa to being spatially aligned by that, um, by that um, cellular structure. So that's, that's nano-engineering in a biological um, sense at its best. Now, one of the other things that's different about um, bee visual systems, insect visual systems, and ours um, is the spectral range over which these animals are um, sensitive to light. So we have three color receptor types, blue, green, and red, um, as they're commonly called, although the red receptor isn't strictly a red receptor. It, it's maximally sensitive in the yellow, but it allows us to see red. Its, it's sensitivity expands into the red. Bees have three color receptor types as well, only very different ones. So, by the way, these are sorry, spectral sensitivity curves. Here's a wavelength scale from 300 to 700 nanometers. So here's the UV, um, and then um, over to the, the red at the 700 nanometer end of this scale here. And this is the spectral sensitivity as a function of wavelength. And so bees have these three roughly Gaussian-shaped um, sensitivity curves with the peak in the UV, the blue, and the green. The UV, of course, is um, where we're not sensitive at all. And thus allows bees to see patterns in flowers that are entirely inaccessible um, to us. So, if, for example, you look at um, this particular flower here, then some of the, um, the, the petals in the visible light are, um, they're, well, they're all yellowish, but um, of these three that are yellow, this, this, and this, um, one of them is UV reflecting these two, as indicated by the dark um, shade in these um, photographs, is, is UV absorbing. This particular flower, which is, is homogeneously yellow for us human um, observers, has a margin to its tube, which is UV reflecting, whereas this back here is entirely UV absorbing, for example. So there's, there's a whole world out there that's inaccessible to our visual systems, um, but not to bees. Now, bees at least are similar to us in that they're both trichromatic. Um, bees are, um, bees like us have three color receptor types. Now, there are lots of visual systems out there um, which exceed these trichromatic systems by far in complexity. Um, so not all animals have just two or three color receptor types. There are many insects that have four or five. And these stomatopod crustaceans actually have more than a dozen color receptor types. Um, ranging all the way from the UV um, into um, the, the far red. Um, and we can't really imagine how that sort of color vision system um, works in comparison to our relatively low dimensional systems. One important take home message is different animals have very different color vision systems. And of course, it's natural to um, ask whether that somehow reflects the needs that they face in their, um, their daily ecologies. And so, specifically with the, the question with respect to bees is, do their UV, do the, does the presence of UV receptors in all species of bees have something to do with their visitation, their, their habit of visiting flowers on a daily basis? That's all the worker bee does from morning to night, visit flowers. And of course, since flowers reflect UV here, by the way, is another um, striking example of a flower that looks more or less homogeneously yellow to us, where, however, there's a central part that um, um, is strongly UV absorbing, whereas the periphery here is, is UV reflecting. Here's a um, bumblebee antenating, touching with its antenna, this, um, this margin between the UV absorbing and the UV reflecting. So why do be, um, bees have UV receptors? Well, one reason could be that um, that, um, they, they, um, they, 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 that it's arisen in conjunction with the habit of, of visiting flowers. And, of course, we want to ask such questions in more quantitative ways than just asking about the presence or absence of receptors. We want to know whether the specific wavelength tuning, where exactly receptors are sitting on the wavelength scale, is, is, um, is, is optimal 
or, or, in, or, or quantify the ways in which it's off optimality. And for that, we need um, color space, um, which I won't bother you with the, the details too much of because it's complicated. Um, but, but in simple terms, a color space is a map that allows us to um, judge distances between points which are reflective of perceived color differences. Um, it also allows us to um, judge an animal's subjective hue, which is encoded in the angular position as measured from the center. So any point up here is B blue, anything over there is B blue green, everything down here is B green, and so on. More importantly, the distance between two points indicates discriminability. So these are very similar colors, hard to distinguish, whereas, for example, these two um, are, are colors that are, that are easy to, to distinguish for the animal, in this case the bee that has this color space. So what we want is we want receptors um, that are optimally spaced along the spectrum and optimally placed along the spectrum to facilitate discrimination, to maximize distances between color points. And so what we've done here is move color receptors along the wavelength scale, then fed hundreds of precisely measured floral reflectance um, spectra into a computer simulation and asked the computer essentially to find the optimum wavelength positions for, um, for, for the receptor types. So what um, the, was done here in this particular case is we measured the, th the spread of color loci in color space for three combinations of three color receptors. And specifically what was done is in this particular simulation, the UV receptors and the blue receptors were kept constant at the wavelength positions where they really occur in bees, i.e. at 340 nanometers for the UV receptor, 540 for the green receptor, and we've moved the blue receptor around or the medium, middle wave receptor from 360 to 440, where it actually really occurs, to 520 to 20 nanometers. And what you see, obviously, is that the spread of color loci in color space is affected by such movements, and that of these three, um, it's fairly obvious that this is the better solution to spreading these color points out in color space compared to this or that um, solution where um, they're clearly pretty squashed, and while you'll be able to discriminate what's here and here in this particular arrangement. What's in here, for example, might be pretty poorly distinguishable. So where exactly are the optimal um, receptors for coding flower colors? So what we have here, ignore the column, the bar graphs um, for, for the time being. We have here an optimum function for the position of the UV receptor, one for the blue receptor, and one for the green receptor. So we've varied, we've moved the UV receptor from 300 to 400 nanometers, and this is um, the, the quality of color discrimination that you get for these 11 steps, 10 nanometer steps of, um, of um, where the receptor was placed. And the optimum UV receptor is at 330 nanometers up there. Um, I don't know, if there, is there a pointer? Is this a pointer? Here's an optimum blue receptor at about 430 nanometers, and uh, the optimum green receptor is about 550. Now let, look at the column graphs. What you see here are the um, UV receptors, blue receptors, and green receptors actually implemented in about 40 um, different um, um, insect species quantified by intracellular recordings. So this is where UV receptors, blue receptors, and green receptors really occur most frequently at 340, 430, and 540 nanometers, which is almost exactly where theory predicts they should be, i.e. by these model calculations. So these are real data from insect eyes. These are model data modeled only with um, spectral reflectance functions of flower colors as an input to the simulation. And the two match almost exactly. So the, the, if, if, if an engineer was to design an optimum B color coding system, they pretty much couldn't do better than what nature's already invented um, over 100 million years ago. Now, one extension of that sort of question, what are optimal color coding systems, is asking questions about color constancy. 
when the light environment changes, then so does the light reflected, reflected from objects um, in our environment, and that means that the physical stimulus changes. So the color perceived changes too. And one um, environment where that's especially the case, that illuminant changes are, have especially drastic effects on um, the, 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 um, the object reflectance that, that, that reaches our eye back from um, the light that's incoming is underwater environments. And so this is um, studied by um, Simon Emberton, who is, who is co-supervised by Andrea Cavallara and myself. Um, and he's here drawn um, the distribution of light, spectral power distribution, at various depths, starting from pretty much near the surface at the top to increasing depths as you go lower down. You can see that the spectrum compresses increasingly. Now, there's no easy way to compensate for that for a, for a visual system. If there's no light there, then there are certain parts of the spectrum you just can't see. And that, in turn... Oops, sorry, just to introduce him again. <laughs> there he is. Um, so um, that's one of the, the several collaborations that we have between um, EECS and, and SBCS. So here's one of the images that Simon's provided me um, with that, fa that illustrates the extent to which the spectrum gets compressed even at moderate depths um, in underwater. And so you, you, you of course, lose uh, quite a bit of the, the um, color display that, in, in this case, these fish might actually have. And you lose valuable biological information, of course. Um, and if you could, to some extent, reconstruct um, from available information of, about the rules of color shifts at greater depths um, what colors these fish actually have, then, of course, you regain that information that actually gets lost by, um, by an increasingly narrow spectrum of light available. And that is, of course, a, a question that's, that's useful for divers, um, um, as well as for biologically relevant questions. If you actually want to reconstruct the reflectance spectra of corals, fish, and so on, observed at greater depths, um, then, then through perhaps such evolutionary modeling types that I've just shown you, but also, of course, feeding back into um, hardware that you might develop for underwater goggles um, that might be very useful. And again, one trick that we could perhaps employ is look to nature for inspiration. How have fish, for example, operating at various depths solved the problem of varying spectral light quality? And it turns out that there are quite a number of fish that are wearing colored goggles, um, and, uh, and indeed that, that um, have color-changing goggles, so to speak, um, depending on the light climate they're operated in. So here is an, um, one species of fish, the masked greenling, which you can see in this photo has rather remarkably red eyes. But it doesn't always have red eyes. It only has red eyes if there's lots of light. Um, so there, in the, this is the, the lens um, shown in, uh, in the light-adapted state. Here it is in the dark adapted set, and you can see that all the pigment that makes it red has been withdrawn into the corners. So here the lens is pretty much entirely clean. Here's an, inter clear. Um, here's an intermediate stage in twilight um, where, where it's sort of orangey. So this fish sees the world through a different lens depending on what light climate is there. And of course it is very interesting then to explore how that might be um, might be um, related to optimizing color discrimination at various, in various light climates and to see whether such solutions are actually viable for um, equipment that could be used by human divers, for example. So that's Simon's project. Um, there are many other inspirations that, um, that um, I think engineers have drawn or have, have been interested in from, from, bio, from, from insect sensory systems. One challenge for humans sometimes is to detect forest fires because you can't actually see them when it's bright daylight. Um, from a distance, you can see them at night, of course, but not during daylight. You want to catch them early on. And um, so here's an infrared, infrared um, satellite image of a forest fire, so you can use that sort of technology if it's not too cloudy. Um, but there is um, something in the animal kingdom that's... that's uh, been optimized to detect forest fires again long ago. Here's a fire beetle. Um, they're called fire beetles because um, they seek out freshly burnt wood to lay their eggs on, because that's what their larvae consume. So they need a good forest fire, and they need to be able to, um, to, to um, detect it from 
from a distance. And it turns out that these um, fire beetles have eye eyelets, so to speak, on their bottoms. Insects have sense organs in all kinds of peculiar locations, not just on the head. Um, so they have these um, infrared receptors, it turns out, um, on um, th their abdomen. These are actual infrared receptors, not heat receptors. So they are um, heat receptors, of course, are, are inherently non-directional. So if you feel warmth, then um, that warmth could originate anywhere. But if you can detect infrared light, you can see, of course, the direction that light comes from. And these beetles can, um, can detect forest fires from up to 32 um, kilometers away. Um, and it turns out they're ex especially um, sensitive to radiation at just the, the, the wavelength that, um, that's emitted um, maximally by, by forest fires. And interestingly, the, the American military immediately became um, very interested in this sort of biological research um, that was actually initially conducted just for understanding biological things. Now, beyond peculiar sensory abilities, bees especially um, are very good at learning. So as I mentioned, they have to learn to associate the patterns that they're presented with by flowers um, and associate them with rewards um, in these flowers so they can then return to the same type of flower time after time. They can, it turns out they can't not, can not only learn to associate, say, colors or bilaterally symmetric flowers um, with um, rewards, but they can also learn certain principles um, that emerge from... Um, from such visual patterns. Here's an experiment by Mandi M. Srinivasan and, and co-authors where he um, showed that bees see visual illusions in a similar kind as, as, as we would. So he first trained them to, um, to um, obtain a reward for, next to this pattern and then faced them with a choice of this and this particular pattern, even though physically, of course, this and this, in terms of the individual components in these images, is precisely the same. The bees would then prefer this particular one, which gives an illusion of there being a square um, where there's actually just um, four little um, three-quarter circles with, with, a, with a corner missing. One peculiar way in which we've exploited um, bees' um, learning behavior is we ask the question of whether bees can recognize images of human faces. Um, one reason being that, of course, um, face recognition is um, is regarded by many people as a uniquely human um, feat that, um, that um, um, well, as in this um, um, statement by The Economist, is the glue which holds societies together and which has enabled <coughs> humanity to develop a complex culture unique in the animal kingdom. Now, one way of asking the question of whether humans are special is, of course, to turn this question, question on its head and see are there other animals that have the same or have some ingredients of face recognition um, as, as humans do. And so we used a, a, a textbook test to um, diagnose a, a condition called prosopagnosia, the disability essentially where people cannot recognize or memorize human faces. We used the same test for our bees. So here's a set of um, faces. We um, uh, rewarded the bees with sucrose solution on a little platform next to one of these images and then had it discriminate a string of other faces um, from that particular um, um, uh, uh, training face and needless to say with this fairly simple discrimination which we started the bees on they did pretty well next to 90% correct but for all the others um, even though some of these faces are reasonably similar if you have a um, visual system that's quite a bit um, poorer in spatial resolution than ours. The bees did pretty well, all near 80%, although they failed if you flip the faces um, upside down. Now, that doesn't mean the bees recognize faces as faces. This is just a strange flower for a bee associated with the reward, essentially, but it works. So it's clearly face recognition can be done if you just have the general ability of visual pattern recognition. Um, and um, we, of course, were then interested in asking. So at the time, of course, c computer um, systems, when we did these experiments, were still pretty poor at automatically recognizing faces. Now, that world has changed altogether since. So we were interested in asking how the bees um, do this. And it turns out that when you track bees' um, movements when they're analyzing the faces, they seem to scan the outline as opposed to... Um, human observers, which, um, which are um, often strongly focused on eyes and um, other landmarks in the face, the bees didn't give a damn about eyes. They just um, 
scanned around the, the outline. So one way of memorizing um, a face or another visual pattern for a bee might simply be to memorize the motor pattern that's required to um, scan along its margins, for example. Very different from, from how humans do it. Now, should we be surprised? Is it surprising that bees with their pinhead brains can do something as advanced as recognizing um, images of faces? And the, the answer to should we be surprised is actually no. Um, lots of even fairly advanced tasks, if you actually ask the question of how many neurons are needed to solve that task, um, uh, have found that the answer is often in the dozens to hundreds of neurons, not more in sort of um, neural network simulations. So here's a, a, a one model for, for face recognition um, by Aitken, Aitken and McDonald's, um, where they found that for, I think, a, a thousand faces, all they needed um, was a receptor level of 32 by 32 pixels. This would roughly be how a bee might view the Mona Lisa. Um, and a few hundred interneurons, and you get 95% accuracy um, for recognizing these faces. So it's not, in terms of neural terms, um, a very demanding um, task um, to, to recognize um, faces. So it's not that special, perhaps. Now, bees' brains indeed are small compared to ours. Um, they, um, they, they, they are about a cubic millimeter in, um, um, in, um, in size and contain um, quite uh, well, less than, than a million neurons, which is thousands of what you have in your retina alone. Um, so relatively fewer neurons than invertebrates. And so in that sense, um, one reason why we're studying them is we're hoping to find in bees computationally less demanding solutions and more tractable solutions to cognitive problems um, than might be um, explored in, in humans. Now, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that while it's easy to sort of draw networks, and I'm saying this at some risk of hypocrisy because we've done it ourselves in, in these images here, it's relatively um, easy to, to draw neural networks as kind of circuit boards, as precisely predetermined connections between different um, 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 neural relays that have been identified in, in the bee's neural system and generate an impression of, of neatness. Of course, this isn't how nervous systems actually work um, or look. So here's um, one um, actual brain circuit board, if you wish. So the, um, for, for the Drosophila brain, um, about 16% of, of um, neurons and their connections have already been mapped by Anshin Jiang um, in 2011 in a landmark paper in current biology. And here's just a handful of neurons um, and the extent to which they're intertwined, um, dyed up, colored in, um, in, in this um, Drosophila fly brain. And what you can see, of course, is that it's tremendously messy. These are not precisely defined circuit boards. Um, these are um, structures that have more the shape of trees with, with lots of little branches and twiglets and so on. And of course, neural connections are not as precisely defined as circuit boards. There are, there are th these things grow over time like trees during development. Um, and of course, there are lots of stochastic processes that feed into how these neurons grow, which neurons they connect with, and so on. And I don't think we can understand how brains actually work without understanding these developmental um, stochasticities and wiring up the nervous system. So that's one um, thing that we're trying to explore with um, two further PhD students, Fei Peng and Mark Roper, um, who are again co-supervised between um, SBCS and um, X, um, is to understand how nervous systems solve these cognitive tasks in perhaps fairly robust and clever ways um, as different from current sort of predetermined circuit boards um, in which we solve computational um, questions in, in computer sciences. Here, by the way, is an over 100-year-old um, image from um, Ramon y Cajal um, on, on the B um, visual system and its connections. And you can see already that um, they were quite aware then of the um, complexities and, and relative non-simplicity in that sort of visual system. 
Now, one other factor that I'd mentioned initially that, of course, bees need to face on a daily basis is spatial orientation. Um, and we can do this in fairly defined lab setups, but then, of course, that doesn't capture the full complexity of, um, of uh, that, that bees face in nature where they have to um, forage over several kilometers, um, where we can't just run after bees and see um, which spatial locations they, um, they, they visit. So we have a solution by way of, of harmonic radar tracking where we have a, a rotating radar um, and uh, which sends us a signal bounce back by a transponder. We can't, of course, load anything battery-powered onto a bee. So here's a bee with a little transponder that bounces back twice the frequency to, um, to the radar set. And that way we can um, track bees and their spatial whereabouts over entire foraging bots. So here's one set in a meadow near Rothamsted. Here's the nest. Here's a spatial foraging task where they have to find an optimal solution to linking um, five different flowers. Um, and let's see if we can get this to work. So here's a, a naive bee's track. Um, first of all, she flies out and misses the first flower altogether, then finds a second one um, here. Um, this, the little um, pink arrows, by the way, are, um, are indicating wind direction. Um, so the, the, the strength and uh, so the direction is the arrow, and the, the, the um, size of the arrow is, is um, the, the, the intensity of the wind. So the bee's faffing about forever uh, around this flower here. So her task, remember, is to link all the five flowers in an optimal circuit. So now she's found a second one. She's feeding from that one. This wasn't clearly an, an optimal route. I should say that these feeders are so far apart that the bee can't see one from another. Okay, now she's um, exploring on a loop out here, coming back to a flower, which is always a waste of time because she's just um, emptied it. Now she's going back to the first one, um, again, that's a waste of time because she's already um, depleted the nectar, then sort of makes a stab back in the direction of the nest, goes back to this flower, um, then um, loops way out um, into the countryside, doesn't find anything, comes back to um, another flower, and this, I think, um, goes, goes on for a bit. So let me just see if I can switch to the next slide. So here are a number of tracks of naive bees trying to um, link these, um, these uh, the simple set of five flowers. So in this case, for example, she's missed these two feeders altogether. That one's missed this one, um, and so on. So these clearly aren't um, very good. Um, but if you... Oh, sorry. I must have skipped a few, few slides here. Sorry. Um, so what you see if, if you test experienced bees is that they actually link all the, flight, the five flowers with straight tracks um, in a... In, a, in an optimal path after about um, a dozen or 20 foraging bouts. And of course, one, of, one way we're trying to explore this is understand what rules that guide them to solve these kinds of traveling um, salesman problems with relatively computationally inexpensive solutions. Now, bees also communicate about space um, via their, their um, so-called dance language. Um, that's honeybees specifically. So a, a bee that's, um, that's uh, returned from a foraging patch um, out there somewhere kilometers away from its hive, then announces the location of the food source by its so-called waggle dance. So what you observe in um, the hive is, is this sort of pattern. This happens, of course, normally in the darkness of the hive, is that the bee runs in a straight line, then runs around in a half circle, another straight line, another half circle, and so on. And this particular motor pattern um, encodes two other bees the precise spatial coordinates of the food source in such a way that, for example, if... So here's the hive, here's the sun. If the food source is in the direction of the sun, the bee runs straight up in the darkness of the hive. So straight up in the hive means, fly, means to others, fly in the direction of the sun. If the bee does its waggle run straight down, that means fly opposite the direction of the sun. Okay, and so in a f if the bee waggles in a 45 degree direction relative to the direction of gravity, that means fly out 45 degrees to the right of the sun. So the system uses both the, su the sun's position as well as gravity as a reference. And of course, one um, way to explore this sort of behavior is not by us visually analyzing a bee's behavior, but to analyze it by um, automated algorithms. So one of the um, projects that we're 
um, trying to figure out with Andrea and um, various of his, um, his, his co-workers, including Fabio and um, a visitor last summer, Eliana, <coughs> Um, is to find, to identify bees from the, the crowd of bees that you might have out there on the hive as either dancers versus non-dancers, and then to decode automatically the information conveyed in the dances, and also to understand how dances, dancing behavior, might emerge essentially as a, as a syntax and, and um, grammar of simpler movements. So you could decompose dances into individual leg movements, as we've seen earlier with the mice. Then, of course, you get a pattern generator that coordinates all six legs in order to generate forward locomotion. Motion. Then you nest that in a routine which controls forward locomotion in such a way that you have a forward waggle run for a few um, millimeters, centimeters, then a half circle to the left, then a half circle to the right, and so on. So there's a syntax and a grammar of movements here that, of course, lends itself hopefully quite neatly to analyzing um, by, by automated systems, motion capture, and so on. Bees don't only use that dance language to communicate about food sources, but also about um, new locations to use for a home. Bee, bees have a very unusual way, honeybees, um, to um, find new homes, um, that is, to, and to propagate. Um, that is, it's not the young ones that leave the nest, but it's the old queen together with several thousand of our worker bees that relocates to a new hive. And what you find then initially is that the queen leaves with a few thousand workers. They uh, form a cluster on a tree, such as this one. That's a bee swarm. And then scouts fan out from this swarm in all directions and explore again the territory several miles wide and, and, and large, um, return to that swarm cluster and convey spatial information of suitable nesting sites that they have, in, as individual scouts, discovered. Now, the ultimate goal is to get the whole swarm into one location. Okay, They can't live by their own, so they have to move as a swarm. And so there are lots of dancers with conflicting information returning from different sites that they've discovered, bringing back the information to the swarm um, and, and advertising it. And then if you look at such swarms over time, so this is over um, three summer days, 20th of July, 21st of July, 22nd of July, um, and in each of these, these are each two-hour intervals where bees indicate, dancers indicate different locations that they've discovered. A very wide arrow means lots of dancing has indicated that particular direction. Du um, the, the length of the arrow means um, how far was that particular location that was advertised. So initially, you can see there was this western, uh, sorry, eastern location that was advertised quite heavily. But over time, next two hours, this largely fades, and then no one advertises it here anymore. And then there's a um, south easterly, westerly location that's been discovered here that increases in popularity over the course of, um, of um, the three days. And in the end, all the dances indicate just one location. And then the whole swarm lifts off. Um, and in the cloud, in a cloud roughly the size of a school bus, um, then um, flies several kilometers to the target location. So they've achieved a consensus from lots of divergent opinions in a process that, that um, Tom Seeley calls honeybee democracy. And needless to say, you need some, with a simple brain like that, I guess, you need some simple rules by which to achieve that sort of consensus. And what actually is going on on these swarms there's no comparison. There's also no one counting votes. The consensus building happens by a fairly simple stochastic process, and that is how it works. A bee that's found a good location advertises it for longer. That's all. So what does that mean? A bee that's found a good location, a good cavity that's a nice dry tree hole with a not-too-wide opening away from the wind and so on, comes back and advertises it for a long time. It goes basically there, 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 there for several minutes. Okay. There's another bee that's found a location, but it's so-so. It's inspected. It's, it's a little damp um, and um, a bit too small. But all things considered, we don't know yet which, if we're going to find anything better. So she advertises it anyway. But she goes there, there, there. End of. 
And what that means is by simple stochastic processes, other bees on the swarm are more likely to bump into a dancer that has good information than they are to bump into a dancer that has poor information. So bees that have attended a dance will then go to the same location, inspect it, and if they found it so-so, they'll go there, there, there. Um, but if they found it very good, they go there, 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 there. Again, by stochastic process, it's more likely that other bees that currently don't have any information about good locations will attend a dance that lasts for longer and which therefore conveys better information. And so in this kind of snowballing effect, gradually the whole swarm converges on one opinion. So it's a very simple rule by which you can make um, fairly complex decision-making and achieve a consensus. Now, how you might use that sort of um, technique um, in simple machines, you might have seen this Harvard B paper project in science a few weeks ago um, where they're trying to get little tiny robots to fly. Um, at this stage, that really isn't much more than flying that they could do. But of course, if you could have swarms of these things trying to find survey disaster areas and try to find trapped victims, for example, and then come back with the information or send it back in order to where to allocate your um, efforts, um, then that might be a fairly um, neat system to seek inspiration from such simple um, information acquiring and integration mechanisms that you find in, in bee swarms. So I'll finish um, with a quote from um, John Lubbock, um, who some of you might know as the person who gave you bank holidays. Um, but in addition to being a, a, a politician, he was also a naturalist. He was indeed a, a bit Darwin's apprentice, and they did lots of things together. He was the man, by the way, who discovered UV sensitivity in insects and ants. That actually was in, in the 1870s. And here's a quote on intelligent sensing by um, John Lubbock, intelligent sensing by animals, of course. We find in animals complex organs of sense richly supplied with nerves, but the function of which we are as yet powerless to explain. There may be 50 other senses as different from ours as sound is from sight. And even within the boundaries of our own senses, there may be endless sounds which we cannot hear, and colors as different as red from green, of which we have no conception. The familiar world which surrounds us may be a totally different place to other animals. Finish here. Thank you very much for your.